Hi guys, welcome to Virtual Youth Group. Hey, tonight we are going to play a round of Impossible Trivia, and then we are going to talk about a guy named Mephibosheth. It's a really hard name to say. Um, Mephibosheth, I will probably say it wrong several times tonight, but that's all right. He is an interesting character from the Old Testament, and uh, we'll chat about him. But first, we're going to play some Impossible Trivia, and here is how you play. All right, so Impossible Trivia is very simple. I'm going to show you a trivia question on screen. It is not something you should know the answer to. It'll be a numerical answer. Uh, so it'll be a number, whether it's in pounds, in years, um, in dollars, things like that. And all you have to do is give us an answer, and whoever's closest without going over gets the point. If you give an answer and then someone else likes your answer so much they want to give it to, that's great. If that's the correct answer, you'll get two points, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, winner gets a prize. Sound good, Leah? Prize. Sounds good. All right. So here we go. Going into the very first question. In its opening weekend, Star Wars debuted in 43 theaters. How much money did it earn in that weekend? So without using the internet, no cheating here, how much money did Star Wars make in its opening weekend. Like the original Star Wars? Yeah, like the one that's called Star Wars. Episode 4. Episode 4, <laughs> Star Wars. Before they changed the name of it to A New Hope, <laughs> when it was just called Star yeah. Wars, back in the good old days. Okay. All right, so I'm not going to give you the answer right now. We're going to go through all of these questions, and then at the very end, I will go through the answers. That gives people a chance to catch up. We don't have to worry about... Uh, making sure everybody has enough time. So here we go. Going on to question two. Minnesota is called the land of 10,000 lakes. How many lakes does it actually have? I'm guessing at least one. Probably around 10,000. Mm, maybe that's just like, I don't know, like a nickname. You know, like uh, Helen is the face that launched a thousand ships, but I doubt there are really a thousand ships. I didn't count them. It's too many. <laughs> All right. So Minnesota, 10,000 lakes. Is that real? How many are there actually? You go ahead and tell us in the comments. And question three is coming up next. What year was frozen pizza first sold in the United States? Frozen pizza. When did the United States what? become the United States? 1776? <laughs> there we go. Hopefully it was then. You think they'd frozen pizza in 1776? <laughs> that seems too late. Too early. Too that late. seems too <laughs> early. It Remember, if you, if you guess too late, though, no points. You've got to give us the date exactly or before. I'm going to go with 1776. I think Leah doesn't know how freezers work or power or a history of engineering. Icebox. Uh, question three. <laughs> Michigan's really cold in the winter. Question four, I mean, I believe this is four, right? Yeah. All right. Between 1975 and 1995, how many U.S. states experienced an earthquake? Like the pro wrestler, John Tenta, earthquake? I bet he performed in a lot of states. <laughs> but how many experienced it? Well, if he performed there, that's probably an experience, right? That's probably not what they're talking about. Probably like actual tectonic plate shifting, earthquakes, rumbling, things like that. It's true. Tetonic is almost as hard as saying Mephibosheth. <laughs> Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. All right. <laughs> Mephibosheth. How many states had an earthquake in those 20 years? Let us know. On average, how many pounds of cheese does the uh, average American <laughs> eat? On average, how many pounds of cheese does the average American adult eat? I left out the word adult on this slide. So, I mean, kids eat less cheese than adults, Are you maybe. Sure? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, tell us, how many pounds of cheese do you think the average adult eats in a year? And then be prepared for, like, a really uncomfortable answer when you realize how much cheese you eat. <laughs> I'm sure this probably doesn't apply to, like, lactose intolerant. Or adults, vegans, like Tim. V vegans. Yeah, like, like Tim Benjamin is definitely vegan, eats zero pounds of cheese a year. <laughs> he hates the slaughter of animals. Yes. And the gathering of their milk. <laughs> yes. And the curdling of their milk. Curdling. 
Curdles. That's the worst. I don't know how to make cheese. <laughs> That's cottage cheese. Oh. <laughs> what year did McDonald's introduce the Happy Meal? I'll give you a double point if you guess the original price. Some of you older folks, no offense, might remember the launch of the Happy Meal. I don't know. I wasn't. I, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. So, what year did McDonald's introduce the Happy Meal? And double point if you guess the original price. Take a guess here, Leah. What do you think it is? What year? Mm-hmm. I'm going to guess late 80s. Late 80s, she says. I'm not going to tell her if she's right or not. She'll have to find out at the end like the rest of you. But I will tell you that Happy Meals make me happy. I like toys. How many innings did the longest game in Major League Baseball history last? The longest game in Major League Baseball history. How long was it? Innings is a weird way of measuring things. Innings. An inning could be like three pitches or like a hundred runs. Innings could take almost no time. I guess it could be six pitches because that would be a half inning. That's true. Was it the longest game in time or just innings? Innings. The longest game in innings. How many degrees must the inside of a toaster get to make toast? I mean, if it's not hot enough, you just get warm bread. Yeah. Are you on, like, the white bread setting or, like, the dark bread setting? Like the bl black burnt setting? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, this is a degrees question, though. So, I mean, like, the minimum amount of degrees. I don't even have a toaster. I use an air fryer to make toast. It's true. It's better. Air fryers are where it's at. Plug for air fryers. Get an air fryer. <laughs> Get an air fryer. Get an air fryer. You'll, it'll make you so happy. If I had to choose between all of my other kitchen appliances and an air fryer, it would be the air fryer. I mean, I feel like the stove might be better because it can cook enough food for all of us. Where like okay, the air fryer the counter, can't. Okay, countertop appliances. Oh, okay. I'd get rid of the Ninja and the Instant Pot. You have a Ninja? And the Crock Pot. Yeah. Like we also have a soda stream. We don't really want it, though. Anyone want a soda stream? <laughs> you, can, you can have a soda stream. Put it in the comments. That's right. It's the prize. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't until right now. <laughs> All right, we're going to the next question. <laughs> what year were toothpaste tubes invented? So not toothpaste. Toothpaste has been around for a long time. But what year were tubes invented? The tubes that the toothpaste goes in. What did they come in before? Little pots? Well, I mean, toothpaste used to be dry and then, like, probably just like a jar. I don't know. Was it a paste then? Or was it a powder? I mean, toothpaste as a powder is still toothpaste. Could you add water to make it a paste? I've decreed it. I've declared it. <laughs> it is absolutely 100% toothpaste. But either way, your question is what <laughs> year was the tube invented, Leah? Gander, a guess? 19... 41. <laughs> no idea. It's all right. At least she's pretty. <laughs> How many people could be seated in the Roman Colosseum? The Roman Colosseum, the site of gladiator battles, the site of Maximus, Decimus, or Meridius announcing that he is, you know, emperor or should have been the emperor, like the greatest speech in film history. Tim, if you're watching this, which I know you are. The greatest speech in film history. Any other guys in my men's group, you know what I'm talking about. It's such a good speech. Do you know the speech I'm why, talking about? Why are you putting Easter eggs in the youth, in the youth program? I don't know. You put one in for Jason last week. <laughs> I, it's true. Either way, it is such a good speech. Well, may, maybe I'll tell you about it at another time. I'll, I'll quote it to you, but yeah, I have to read it. But how many people could be seated in the Roman Coliseum? Oh, yeah. How many people could be seated in the Coliseum? Hey, you know what? I'll give you another... Bonus point, if you can tell me how many people in the Coliseum were actually cardboard cutouts in the movie Gladiator, <laughs> I'll give you double points. Huh? All right, so if you can tell me how many people from the Coliseum scenes were actually cardboard cutouts, you'll get an extra were point. Were they really cardboard? Yeah. I mean, in the, in the movie, not actual. Well, yes, obviously. They didn't have cardboard <laughs> during Roman times. Who was yeah. cardboard invented? That's not one of the questions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. All right, coming up next. What year did Lego start making minifigs? Now, if you don't know what a minifig is, the little Lego guys, we sometimes call them, you know, they think everything is awesome. They have, like, this kind of hand. I can't find the camera. There we go. Like, this kind of hand. And they, like, dance and 
master build. Sometimes they're spacemen or construction workers or cats. Thanos. Sometimes they're cats. And minifigs can't be cats. They Why can not? be Thanos, though, because I've seen cats and they just don't look like minifigs. <laughs> Either way, what year did Lego start making minifigs? That is your question. How many times can Rhode Island fit inside of Texas? This is the last question. I want to know how many times Rhode Island can fit inside of Texas. I bet it's more than twice. Probably. Maybe it's know. even more than four times. Some people might think that Rhode Island is just a state for ants. It should be like three times that big. I have no idea how big Rhode Island is. Mm, this big. I've seen the maps. It's really hard to find. <laughs> All right. So there were 12 questions with two possible bonus points, which means you can get up to 14 points. Of course, we didn't give you the answer. So I'm going to tally who got the most points and I will announce both the answers and the winners at the end of the, uh, the live stream this evening. And then uh, after that, we'll go ahead and get you guys some prizes in the next day or so. So we've been talking about kind of these individual Bible characters. We've talked about uh, Judas and Thomas and Jezebel. And I was trying to figure out who to talk about tonight. I've had a couple of people make some suggestions. And I was just kind of walking through it and working through it, and somebody suggested David and Goliath, and I thought, man, that's a really well-known story. It might be too hard to come up with something that is just not really well-known. And I was talking to Pastor Tim, and he said, what about uh, Mephibosheth? M Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth. So that's a really hard name to say, Mephibosheth. And I said, well, I don't know who that is off the top of my head. He goes, well, look him up. And I did, and I found this to be a pretty fascinating story. So. Uh, credit to Pastor Tim for uh, kind of suggesting Mephibosheth. And so I want to talk about him tonight and kind of find out who is he, what can we learn from him, what did he do, um, and go from there. And at the very end tonight, I will drop a link in the chat. And if you want to join me for a discussion on Zoom, uh, just hit that link and you'll, you can open up that chat room. And we can just have a little video discussion about kind of what we learned and see if maybe that uh, is something that we want to do and see if it's something we want to do in the future. So, uh, Mephibosheth, who is he? He is the grandson of King Saul. He is the son of Jonathan, who is David's best friend. Uh, there's a little bit of history we have to cover, but David's story is pretty well known, so I don't really have to go through too much. Um, also, I think his relationship with Saul is pretty well known, uh, so I'm not going to cover all of that. I'm just going to kind of give you the Reader's Digest version as we uh, as we move along here. Uh, so some people that you need to know, you know David, uh, I told you, Mephibosheth, uh, you also are going to want to know about Ziba. Ziba is a servant of Saul who ends up uh, kind of caretaking Mephibosheth's house um, as, as the story progresses. So Ziba is going to be somebody who's kind of important. All right, but just kind of go, going back in time to the very beginning of the story, David was a young man. He gets anointed king over Israel by Samuel, but he has to wait because Saul is already king and David isn't supposed to go and, and fight for this, uh, this kingdom. He's not supposed to fight for the throne. He's supposed to wait. Uh, he goes on to kill Goliath, and that really impresses Saul, and Saul brings him into his household. Uh, he's a musician, and he plays the harp to soothe Saul. Um, he leads the armies of Israel into battle. And then Saul gets wicked jealous of David because people start chanting things like, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And when you're king, you kind of want to be, you know, recognized for being the best. And so he gets really jealous of David. Um, so we're not going to go through the whole story of David, but I really, really encourage you, read David's story. It's, it's a lot of reading, but it's so fascinating. Within the events of the story, David and Saul's son Jonathan, the heir to the throne, become best friends. They become such good friends that Jonathan tells David, when my father dies, you are going to become the king. Uh, I, I'm going to give up my right to the throne. And he makes a pact with David. And he, he asks, he says, David, 
Will you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live? And if I die, will you treat my family with the faithful love of the Lord? And even when the Lord destroys all of your enemies from the face of the earth, will you take care of my family? And David says, yes. And Saul and Jonathan do. They die in battle. Uh, and David becomes the king. And here is where we meet Mephibosheth, right? When Saul and Jonathan die, Mephibosheth's nurse, his caretaker, she flees with the child. She's afraid that he's going to be killed. Um, and so the, the, as they're running, Mephibosheth, he falls or he gets dropped. There's some sort of an incident and he gets injured. Both of his feet are broken and they become disabled and he can't walk. But he goes into hiding for many years. And David has to fight off some rebellion and get the kind of the areas of the country that didn't want him to become king. Um, he's, they've got, he's got to kind of bring them into the fold and fight some wars and battles. But then he remembers his vow to Jonathan and he decides to make good on it. So he goes to Ziba, who I mentioned earlier, who's a servant of Saul, who's been caretaking the land of Saul, who's been kind of leading the house of Saul. And he says, is there anyone left from Saul's line that I might show kindness to? And Ziba tells him about Mephibosheth, who's in hiding. Many years have passed. So Mephibosheth and his son are in hiding. And David goes to Mephibosheth and he says, I'm going to give you back all of the land that was your father's and your grandfather's. And you are going to join my royal court and you're going to sit at my table. He tells Ziba, you'll continue to tend the land and then bring the prophets to Mephibosheth so that he can continue to live. And so time passes. Mephibosheth is in David's court. Mephibosheth is there with David. And then a civil war breaks out. I'm not going to go into all of the details, but one of David's sons named Absalom, he, he gets mad and he decides he should be king. And there's this war that starts. If you have time, I, you'll love it. Just go and read it. It's fascinating. But fast forward into the battle, and Ziba shows up to where David is with a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with provisions. He brings him 200 loaves of bread, 100 cakes of raisins, 100 cakes of figs, and a skin of wine. And David says, where is the grandson of your master? So where is Mephibosheth? And Ziba gives him some bad and unexpected news. And he says he refused to come. He said he's going to stay in Jerusalem because he thinks you and your son Absalom are going to kill one another in battle. And he will have the strongest claim to the throne. He is going to become king again. He thinks the Israelites will make him king. David is not happy, as you can imagine. Here's this person that he's he showed love and kindness to and now he's just been kind of it's, it's, it's this wretched betrayal this un ungratefulness and so david says you know what ziba all that belonged to mephibosheth is now yours so david had given mephibosheth all of saul's lands and now he takes it away and he gives it to ziba david wins the war he returns to jerusalem and who should show up but that traitor Mephibosheth. David confronts him and he asks, where were you? And Mephibosheth tells a very different story from Ziba. He says, I told Ziba to prepare my donkey so I could ride out with the provisions, but he left without me. And now he has slandered my name and he said, I refuse to come. You have been generous to me. You should have killed me when you, with the entire house of Saul. We all should have died. But instead, you have honored me by allowing me to eat at your own table. What more can I ask? I've got nothing else to say. And David says, you know what? You've said enough. You and Ziba, you can split the land. And Mephibosheth responds, I'm just so happy to have you back safely, my lord, the king. So we've got David going against tradition, right? Because the tradition back then is when somebody becomes king, they kill the entire family of the former king. So there's no one with a claim to the throne. And so David, he goes against that tradition. 
And then he hears of this treachery by the person that he saved and he punishes him only to find out that maybe that treachery was coming from somewhere else. And then he reverses his decision ex at least maybe halfway. So, so wait, I'm confused, right? Why didn't David punish Ziba for lying? If Mephibosheth is telling the truth, then Ziba should have been punished. Why did Ziba still get half the land? Did Ziba lie to David? Or did Mephibosheth lie to David? Uh, guys, we don't know. There isn't an answer. There's debate and confusion. And here's kind of my take on it. I think that Ziba was lying. I think that he was not happy about the demotion that he got. He was leading and kind of uh, caring for Saul's lands, and then Mephibosheth shows up, and then he kind of goes right back down to servant. Uh, I think he was trying to elevate his position, but the reality is that there's no answer in the text. So, in fact, it's not even clear who was punished. And okay, So, they may have already been splitting the land. When David tells Ziba to bring the produce to Mephibosheth, he may have said, you know, keep half of it because, uh, you know, you need, you and your 15 sons, you need something to eat too. You're not going to work the land for free. So it may have been in, in a financial agreement and David might have just gone back to that original agreement. Uh, it might be because he didn't know who was telling the truth. He might have just said, you know what, I can't decide who's being honest with me, so just split it. Or he might have split it for political reasons because he was trying to get the Benjamite tribe on his side and it seemed like um, honoring Ziba might be helpful because Saul was a Benjamite. Um, but we don't know the answer to that. I told you kind of my take. Um, but, okay, so, but what can we learn from Mephibosheth and his story? First, and I can't reiterate this enough, the obvious lesson from this story don't drop babies. If you drop a baby, you can hurt them and they might never walk again. But actually, I think that most of the lessons here, they come from David, right? I, I, I've got one that I'll, I'll tell you from Mephibosheth, but most of what I've got comes from David. So I think the first thing that I see here is keep your word. Uh, David made a promise to his friend Jonathan that he would love his, his family and take care of them um, way before he was actually king, way before that decision needed to be made, way before a lot of the events took place. And David could have said, so much has changed, I don't have to do this. And he could have slaughtered Mephibosheth. But he didn't, right? He had an opportunity to put an end to anyone who had a claim to the throne. But instead, he extended the love and the kindness of the Lord to someone who many would have thought was his enemy. Guys, the Lord expects us to be honest. The Lord expects us to keep our word. Um, and he calls us to do the same. Proverbs says, honesty guides good people. Dishonesty destroys treacherous people, right? So we have to be guided by honesty. Uh, and, and I think David's a good example here. Uh, the next thing I think we can learn from David is that the popular answer isn't always the right answer. David would have probably received counsel from all of his advisors saying, kill Mephibosheth. Kill him, kill his son, get rid of them because they might try to take your throne. Deal with it now so you don't have to deal with it later. And when he made a different decision, he was probably given a lot of criticism. People were not happy. He probably had to deal with kind of that. Um, because every time Mephibosheth came to the table of David, there was a reminder that David had made what might be a weak decision, right? It might have been a decision that would end up costing him later. It's this reminder that Saul's line is still out there. He didn't make the popular decision, right? So David doesn't always make the right decisions. I mean, Bathsheba, anyone? Uh, but he's called a man after God's own heart, and I think here... He does the right thing, and it's an appropriate reminder of how to make decisions. And it also comes in the book of Proverbs, what I have. So, uh, you know, Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Guys, when we have a decision to make, 
Trust the Lord. Seek the Lord. Do the thing that God calls you to. It doesn't always mean that there is an obvious answer one way or another, but through wise counsel, through the scriptures, through prayer, we can often figure out what God would call us to. Um, so, so trust the Lord and do things that might seem unpopular if it's the right thing to do. So, but there are two there are two really big things that spoke to me from the story. Now, the first uh, is from David. And, uh, and this is about listening and not making quick decisions, right? Not being rash. When Ziba accuses Mephibosheth of treachery, David pronounces the sentence on the spot. He doesn't appear to ask for evidence. He doesn't appear to ask any questions. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't kind of do his due diligence. He just says, you know what? Fine, you have all Mephibosheth's land. It's kind of harsh and quick and... Uh, it seems like Ziba was lying and David fell into the trap that Ziba had set for him, right? I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this all the time, especially as a parent, right? One of my kids comes in um, and, and they're crying. And so I quickly tell her, brother, go to your room. And then I find out later that I was totally wrong. And the one who's crying was really the one that did something wrong and uh, or no one did anything wrong. And, and I have to kind of go back and say, I made a mistake, right? So... I pull a David and I hand out consequences before I know what's going on. Um, and so so there are other areas of my life where I do that too, right? But where I'm quick to anger, where I'm quick to, to give a reaction, I'm a bit of a reactor. So David, he comes into the situation hot. He doesn't slow down to learn about what's going on. And uh, David, like I said, David's actions speak to me and they reminded me of James's words from the New Testament in the book of James, he says, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires, right? Just a reminder to me to slow down, just a reminder to me to, to, to listen more than I talk so I know what's going on and that my reaction is appropriate, okay? The second thing that I really, really felt today that, uh, that that Mephibosheth did that spoke to me is, uh, don't be too proud to accept help. Mephibosheth is in a bad way, right? He's disabled. He has been disabled his whole life. He's in hiding. He's afraid he's going to get killed. Um, he's probably not doing well, but David offered to help him. And he says, yes, right? He accepts that help. Guys, I talk a lot about the importance of loving our neighbors, uh, the importance of serving others, how we need to give of ourselves. But I know that I personally, as well as a lot of other people, have a hard time being loved as someone else's neighbor, right? I have a hard time being served by someone else. So Mephibosheth is humble and he knows that David has no obligation to help him. And he knows that David has really an expectation to not help him and if not to let him die then to kill him but he takes the help of the king as paul tells us in galatians carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of christ and we absolutely need to learn that right we need to learn to bear the burdens of others like David does, right? David bears Mephibosheth's burden, guys. But I think a bigger lesson, at least for me and maybe for you, I don't know, but is that I need to let other people bear my burdens. Guys, the world is such a weird place right now. A lot of people are struggling. Folks are, they, they don't have uh, money. A lot of folks are out of jobs. I know that there are people that don't have enough food. Um, as the world gets ready to go back to normal, uh, things are going to be difficult, right? If you're struggling, talk to someone and let them bear your burden, right? When you go into public and things don't go as you plan, you know, be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to get angry, right? Be loving and respectful. Show that love and kindness to other people, right? So be respectful, show that love and kindness, bear the burdens of others, but then let other people bear your burdens when you are overwhelmed. So guys, that is Mephibosheth uh, in a nutshell. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, thanks so much for tonight. Thanks for 
uh, chance to talk about this little known character from the Bible, Lord, that I can see his relationship with David, and I can see how David does the right thing, and I can see just kind of how Ziba, it looks like, does the wrong thing, and, and Lord, just thank you for the lessons that we can learn. Lord, we look forward to a time when we can meet together in person, but thank you for technology and the chance to meet uh, the way that we are. Lord, help us to be patient with one another as we go back to normal. Help us to show respect to one another. Help us to, uh, to be your people, Lord, to show your love to our neighbors and everyone else that we come across. In Christ's name, amen. So guys, don't forget, uh, right now I'm dropping a link in the chat. If you would like to join me for a, a Zoom discussion, uh, hit that link and come into the chat room. We can just talk about Mephibosheth and kind of what kinds of uh, lessons you take from the story. And you can ask any questions and things like that. And then if you haven't heard, we are doing a drive-in service at church this Sunday, um, 1045 during Awaken. Um, all of the details are in Pastor Tim's weekly email and they are in, they're on the website. Uh, so, so look for those, but I would love to see you today or not see you today. I'd love to see you today, but I'd love to see you this Sunday at the drive-in service. Um, so yeah, please, please, please come out. And then, uh, hey, look forward for an announcement about our next game night. Um, I just found that I can play code names online via Zoom. So that's what will be on the agenda for our next game night. Um, I will get the details to you ASAP. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's what we've got for you tonight, guys. Hopefully we'll see you in the Zoom chat. Other than that, uh, just remember, guys, Jesus loves you. We love you. And we can't wait uh, to see you again. Bye.